I think we're live now. I think the silence before Wonderful. it starts is a great, it's a great terrifying exactly. moment. <laughs> so while you are joining us for today's lunchtime talk, I wanted to uh, remind you of the events next week. So on Tuesday, there is no lunchtime talk. The center is taking a few days off from online activities so that we can all take uh, a breather from Zoom, which I think we probably all need at some point. However, on Wednesday, as usual, there is a senior visiting fellow seminar organized by Nick Huggett and Chris Hussrich, uh, Cosmology Beyond Space Time. Um, the next uh, meeting so is on Wednesday, March 10th at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time. And the talk will be given by Faye Dauker from the Imperial College London. Um, and so you're all invited to come to this talk. On Friday, we're meeting for the next lunchtime talk at noon, as usual, uh, Eastern Time. And the talk will be given by uh, Kate Stanton from the Department of Philosophy here at Pitt on contrastive coordination and multiphase semantics um, today. It's my uh, great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Kevin Doss from the Department of Philosophy here at uh, Pitt. Kevin is assistant professor in the department, is an associate member of the center. He works on a range of topics but with a focus mostly on epistemology, logic, and philosophy of language. So he has interest also in cognitive uh, science, um, and he's published on uh, uh, these uh, areas in uh, the best journals in the field, analysis, PPR, mind, and so on. Uh, um, and um, he also does a lot of public philosophy, which is uh, one of the places where you might have met uh, his, his work. And I think it's uh, not an exaggeration to defend, to describe him as, as uh, the advocate for the common man's rationality. Uh, and uh, uh, really in actually quite an amazing sequence of, um, of blog posts and interventions in the yeah, public domain or public philosophies actually looked at what people like me and I think many people take to be biases uh, in, in the way we think uh, or uh, cognitive biases and try to, to show how they could actually be uh, rational or consequences of or rationality. Um, it's a very loose spin on, on his work, but that's really an interesting body of work, which I highly recommend if you're interested in the connection between cognitive science, philosophy, and, and formal work. Um, it's really, actually, I find it quite fascinating, in fact. Uh, so, Kevin, uh, the screen is yours. Um, uh, you've got one hour, and then we'll take questions for the QA. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Edward. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. There's a handout in the chat as well, um, or there's a link to the handout. But I'm going through the handout on my screen as well. The handout's just there so you can uh, return to it at your leisure. You'll see it'll be a little bit of a sprint, so you might want to return to it at some point. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Fortunately, I can't see anyone, so who knows? That we're just gonna we run. can, we can. We are, uh, <laughs> it's working. Um, Cool, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be continuing to defend the common person's uh, rationality. So I'm gonna be talking about a somewhat banal topic these days, which is polarization. We all know far too well that uh, society is characterized by deep polarization, societal polarization over politics and religion, economics, everything is profound. People are very far apart in their opinions and it's persistent. Those disagreements don't dissipate or aren't dissipating um, over time as people engage more. But there's an aspect of this polarization that I want to focus on that is often less focused on, um, certainly in the popular discourse. And this is the fact that the polarization we see is also predictable, that the choices you make and the circumstances you find yourself in have a predictable effect on which direction your opinions will shift on which side of the societal disagreement you'll find yourself on. So when you make a choice about where to live, do you live in Boston or Boise? Or you make a choice about what to read, do you read Piketty or Pinker? Or you make a choice about who to follow, do you follow Obama or Fox News? Or you make a choice about how to engage with any of these people. Do you look at what they have to say openly or are you skeptical? All those choices have a predictable effect 
on how your opinions will shift. You can try this if you want tomorrow. If you unfollow all your liberal friends and follow only conservative friends and conservative media, then you can predict that over time, maybe not with certainty, but with quite a bit of confidence, over time your, conf your opinions will start to shift to become more conservative. Over an extended period of time, maybe quite a bit more conservative. So that's the sense which I mean this polarization is predictable. I'm interested in why this happens. Now, there's nothing new about this process. It's a very old process. There's a question about whether it's increasing in modern life, and I'm happy to talk about that. But my main focus is on the, the, the process itself. And there's a standard story for why it happens. The standard story, in effect, says that uh, it's driven by epistemically irrational processes. Things like motivated reasoning and confirmation bias and conformism lead us to glob onto the opinions of the people we talk to and follow, and therefore to irrationally increase our confidence in their ideas. What I'm interested in doing in this project is offering an alternative story, a new story for what's going on when we predictably polarize. The story says, no, no, these processes can be epistemically above board. At, in some ways, the story is perfectly simple and intuitive, but it takes a lot of detail to spell out um, a lot of time to spell out the details. So the basic idea is this. Some types of evidence are more ambiguous than others. They're harder to know how to react to than others. And therefore our choices in how to engage and where to live, et cetera, have predictable effects on that ambiguity. They can make for ambiguity asymmetries. They can make some types of evidence easier to recognize than others. So if you decide to follow only conservative folks, then you make it easier to recognize evidence for conservative opinions, harder to recognize evidence for liberal opinions. You make an objective asymmetry in the ambiguity of your evidence. And that can lead you, I say, to epistemically, rationally, predictably polarize. So in this new story, there's both a familiar fact and a new idea. The familiar fact is that ambiguity, in some sense of ambiguity, leads to biased processing of information. This is a well-confirmed psychological finding. The new idea in the story is that if we properly understand what ambiguity is and what it means to have ambiguous evidence, then the bias in the bias processing need not be in the person. The bias can be in the evidence itself. So that's the idea. The idea is that a rational unbiased attention to in fact ambiguous biased evidence can lead to predictable rational polarization. And the claim is that that is both theoretically possible and empirically plausible as a mechanism that helps drive real world polarization in politics, philosophy, economics, you name it. So obviously there's a lot here. <laughs> there's a lot in that idea and I'm not gonna be able to focus on all the details. Instead, I'm gonna try at some point to get to some of the more empirical stuff today since that's some of the newer stuff that I've been working on. Uh, at various points, I'm gonna say like, look, there's a lot more to talk about here. Do ask me about it, but I'm gonna move along for the point of the presentation. So do ask me about any of those points which are flagged, some of them in the handout. The way I'm gonna make this argument is by telling a story, by telling, in effect, the story of how I came to believe it. <laughs> um, and I wanna do that for two reasons. Right? The first is that it's just uh, the best argument I can give for this claim. Like, hopefully I can try to convince you by, by telling you what convinced me. But the second reason is that it's an instance of my subject matter. Right? Because four years ago or so, I set out on a project, a project to see if I could argue or see whether polarization could be rational. Right? At the time, I didn't believe it, but I thought it was a good research project. And now four years down the line, I predictably do believe it. I am more confident of it. And so that was an instance of predictable polarization on my part, of predictable polarization on the claim that predictable polarization can be rational. And so hopefully by illustrating how I went through that process, I can use that as another argument that the process itself can be rational. Either that, or you get a great illustration of Kevin's biased reasoning processes, and then you can psychoanalyze me as you will. <laughs> All right. So um, let's get started uh, with the theoretical possibilities. 
So section two of your handout. Um, this project started in a somewhat unlikely place. So I was a graduate student in uh, philosophy working on sort of arcane issues in formal epistemology. I was studying um, sort of the foundations of a literature called the higher order evidence literature. I was working on higher order probability as a model of that. Um, in effect, what this literature is, is about sort of cases where individuals have complicated evidence that they're unsure how to react to, and they're unsure if they've reacted to it properly. Maybe they have peers that agree or disagree with them about how to react to that evidence. And so they have some doubt about whether they're rational. And the question is, how can we model that? How should that affect their opinions, if it should? So I was working on this project, um, sort of technical higher order probability models of this project, this idea. And then you may have heard uh, that in 2016, there was a presidential election and it was very contentious uh, and surprised a lot of people, including those of us like me who are in liberal bubbles in, in Boston. Um, and so like a lot of people, I got interested in polarization as a phenomenon. Uh, and also like a lot of academics, I uh, got a little bit concerned about how arcane and abstruse my work was. But, well, the world's not in the best shape. Am I really, uh, does it really need models of high order probability? Is that pre a pressing need? And like, maybe it's not, but is there anything more relevant <laughs> I could do? Um, and so I was happy with how that arcane project was coming along, but I thought I would spend some time thinking about polarization to see if I had anything to contribute to that debate. And so I dove in to the literature uh, in psychology on what drives polarization on issues like the group polarization effect and confirmation bias and a few other things, and some of which we'll come back to in this talk. And what I was struck by was that it felt familiar because the situations in which psychologists found that people would polarize were often situations in which they described their subjects as having ambiguous evidence, mixed signals, things that it's hard to interpret. They don't know how to interpret. And often they would be talking to people about how to interpret that evidence, people who shared that evidence, peers, you might think. Uh, and sometimes they would agree or disagree with them and people would be trying to sort that out. And that's the sort of situation that would lead to polarization. Say, like-minded people discussing shared evidence would lead them to polarize, for example. And as I was looking at this, I thought, huh, um, that sounds a lot like messy, complicated evidence that people are unsure how to react to. It sounds a lot like higher order evidence. So it sounds a lot like peer agreement and disagreement. Maybe there's a connection. And the first way I saw there might actually be a connection is that like all these psychologists were talking about um, people who had ambiguous evidence, but there was no theory of what ambiguous evidence was. It was just sort of an intuitive notion. And I thought, huh, maybe I've got a theory of it. So here's the starting idea. Your evidence is ambiguous in the intuitive sense if it's rational to be unsure how confident to be in response to it. That is, your evidence is ambiguous if it warrants higher order uncertainty, uncertainty about how uncertain you should be. Or maybe more colloquially, your evidence is uncertain if given that evidence, you should be unsure what you should think. And you should be unsure whether you're thinking reasonably or rationally given that evidence. Now there's a formal definition of this on the handout. Don't worry about the formal definition. That's just sort of the, basically what it was, was a way to connect these models of higher order probability I was working on to sort of a concrete phenomenon of ambiguous evidence. Once you make that first connection, um, there's a natural follow-up as well. Psychology finds a connection between ambiguous evidence and polarization. How can we say what polarization is in these sorts of models? And this is pretty straightforward and not original to me necessarily, what the language might be. So in the sort of models where we have reason, rational degrees of belief, it's easy to say that evidence is gonna be rationally, predictably polarizing about some question or some proposition Q. If you'd expect it to move the rational opinion in Q in a particular direction, right? And there's a formalization of this on your handout, but the basic idea is intuitive enough um, if you follow only conservative folks. Why is that evidence you're going to get over the coming weeks predictably polarizing? It's because right now you can expect that in the future you'll be more confident 
of various conservative claims, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a claim about being able to expect which direction your opinions are gonna move. Right? In particular, this is an instance or can be used to generate instances of polarization because it means that you and I can start out with the same beliefs. But if you follow only conservative folks and I follow only liberal folks, then we can both expect that you're gonna become more conservative and I'm gonna become more liberal. And so we're gonna diverge, we're gonna polarize. We both expect polariz polarization to be unsurprised when it results. So that's a formalization of what predictably polarizing evidence is. So now in these sort of abstract Bayesian models, we have these two formal definitions of ambiguous evidence and predictable polarization. In psych studies, you find a tight connection between those two intuitive notions. Question, is there a connection in the formal models? And the answer is yes, there's a very, very tight connection. In order to see this, it helps to uh, put some constraints on the models. And this is something I'm happy to talk about more in the q and I'm gonna zoom through here, but it's basically the evidence had better be well behaved. Um, the constraint is a well-known one called the value of evidence, but the constraint is that evidence is valuable if basically you should want to get that evidence to help make decisions. If no matter what choice you're faced, you should expect that getting that evidence to help make that choice will lead to a better choice, whether that's a choice of what to do or what to think, that sort of thing. So this is a background constraint I'm gonna work with throughout the whole talk. Do ask me about it if you like. But once we impose that constraint, we can see basically ambiguity and predictable polarization are necessary and sufficient for each other. So fact one on your handout says that suppose the evidence you're gonna get is valuable. And if it's unambiguous in the technical sense, it's never, rationally predictably polarizing. That's a theorem just in abstract Bayesian models about um, how to respond to evidence. This is not a new result to me, it's well known. Um, I think this is in some sense the best argument for the standard story that uh, predictable polarization has to be irrational. Because if you just think, well, evidence can't be ambiguous and it's gotta be valuable, then it's a theorem that uh, it can't be predictably polarizing. But there's another side. To that result. And this is a fact two on your handout. It's a generalization of something from Bernard Salo noted a few years ago. She uh, says, look, if evidence is ambiguous, if the evidence you're about to receive is ambiguous, then even if it's valuable, it's always rationally predictably polarizing about some question or other. There's always some claim such that you expect your credence in that claim should move in a particular direction. Um, and that was when I really got started on this project. That was a very intriguing connection just from abstract formal models, we were predicting a connection between ambiguous evidence and polarization, which is exactly the connection that the psych literature was documenting. Right? And so that's when I thought, maybe there's something to this. But I wasn't at all convinced, neither should you be at this point, right? Because like, if you're like most people, like this is Kevin going on and on about like technical mumbo jumbo, like who knows what the hell he's talking about when he's talking about high order probability and predictably, you know, it's all just sort of a bunch of formal results that seem disconnected from reality, or I see no reason to see a connection. And so I knew if I was gonna work on this product, there had to be some way to make the connection vivid and make it real. I also knew that I needed a job talk because uh, I was going on the market in a few years. Uh, and if I was gonna convince anyone to um, hire me, I could not do it by appealing to facts that very few people care about or understand at high order probability. So, um, I need a clear example. And what way to sort of force clarity better than to say, well, can I use an example I construct to polarize my audience? Right? Can I, that would be a way. If I'm right, there should be examples that lead to ambiguous evidence in a way that lead to predictable polarization. So I should be able to predict it, I should be able to do it. So can I come up with an example that would um, work? Here's the example I came up with favorite example of higher order uncertainty. It's called a word completion task. Uh, and it's a task where you're given a string of letters and some blanks. And the question is, is there an English word that completes that string? Do with any other language, but we're doing, gonna use English here. And so what I'll do is I'll flip a coin and I'll show you a string and you have a few seconds to look at it. And after those seconds are up, you have to decide how confident are you that the string is completable. So here is a simple example, five seconds. And now you have to figure out how confident are you that string is completable. And maybe you 
thought, plan it, and you got it, right? You're sure it's completable. But maybe you didn't find one and you were left unsure what to think. Here's another example. Now ask yourself, how confident are you that that string is completable? And I take it, you're sort of like, ah, probably not. I didn't find one, but I'm not sure. Maybe I'm missing something. And so that's the your thought you're supposed to have when you're doing word completion test. Maybe I'm missing something. So that's the example, right? And the claim I'm going to argue for is that um, that example can be used to predictably polarize people. So there are three questions I want to answer about that. First. Why would it be polarizing? Why would this lead to ambiguous evidence and why would that be polarizing? Second, um, why would it nevertheless be valuable? Why, it's the sort of, why would it be the sort of evidence that you wanna get as opposed to sort of an irrational response to weird data? And finally, would it work? You know, would this actually be able to polarize anyone or is this just a epistemologist example? So I wanna address those three questions in turn. The first question is why is this predictably polarizing? Now he, here's the key feature of word completion tasks and why they lead to asymmetric ambiguity, I'd say. The asymmetry in the case is that it's easier to recognize that there is a completion to a word completion task than to recognize that there's no completion to a task, right? To recognize that there is a completion, all you have to do is find one, plan it, and then you know it's completable. To recognize that there's not a completion, you somehow have to rule out the possibility that any of the things you haven't yet considered are completions. So recognizing that there is a completion is an existential task, find an instance. Whereas recognizing that there's none is a universal task, show that there is none. And that asymmetry I say generates an epistemic asymmetry as well. If there is, you're, you, know, you pull up a word completion task, you look at it for five seconds, and now you have to figure out what to think. If there is a word, there is a completion of the task, then you should, I say, on average, be confident that there is. You should find it sometimes, sometimes you won't, but in those cases, you should be middling, you should be unsure. And on average, you should be quite confident that there is a word when there is one. But if there's not a completion, right, you won't find one, and that's evidence that there's not one, but it's not conclusive. And you should be unsure exactly how to interpret it, because maybe the fact that you didn't find one is a signal that there is none. But maybe it's a signal that you messed up, that you missed it, that you weren't, you didn't properly use the evidence you had avail available. Maybe someone's about to whisper planet and you think, oh, damn it, I should have seen that, right? So messed up, that was a mistake. And that's the thought, that's the feeling of having ambiguous evidence of wondering whether you messed up, whether you missed something. Right? And so that's the asymmetry that in the case where there is a word, you can get unambiguous evidence that there is. But in the case where there's not, you can only get ambiguous evidence that there's not. And so on average, this is gonna make you more confident that there's a word. The basic reason is sometimes your confidence should go way up that there's a word. It should never go way down. And so on average, it should go up a little bit. That's the intuition. Now, I'm gonna show you a formal model of this to vindicate the intuition. But if you don't vibe with formal models, don't worry about it, just work with the intuition. I just wanna show my work here. and It's gonna be relevant to some stuff later. So here's a simple toy model. There are many more realistic ones we could give. Um, three, you're about to look at a word completion task. I'm gonna flip a coin and if it lands heads, that string will be completable. Right? And so it's half likely to be completable, half not. Half likely there's a word, half not. Three relevant possibilities after you look at the word completion task. Either there's a word and you will have found one, or there's a word and you won't have found one, or there's no word and you won't have found one. Now, there are a lot of details here. Um, the blue numbers represent prior probabilities. It's just the point is that it's half likely there's going to be a word. The split between these two possibilities doesn't matter. They sum to one half. The key asymmetry is this. If there's a word, you might find one, in which case you get unambiguous evidence. The labeled arrows represent posterior degrees of rational confidence in those possibilities. So the labeled one loop here says, if there's a word and you found it, you should know that. You should be sure that's a word and you found it. So you might get unambiguous evidence. You should know that you should be certain there's a word. But if you don't find a word, you get ambiguous evidence because you should be unsure how confident to be. You should be unsure whether you should be relatively confident there's no word, right? This possibility, basically conditioning on the fact that you didn't find one. Or maybe more confident 
that there's a word. Maybe there's something you're missing. Maybe it looks more word-like than you're giving it credit for. Maybe you should have found one. That's the thought. And so the fact that in this possibility, you should be one third that there's a word. And in this possibility, you should be one half that there's a word. That's the signal of ambiguity that you don't know what possibility you're in. So you don't know how confident you should be. So that's what it means to have ambiguous evidence. Again, if that was too formal, don't worry about it. But the reason then in the model, it leads to predictable polarization is that, look, your prior confidence that there's gonna be a word is one half. That's determined by a coin flip. What's your prior estimate for the future rational confidence, the confidence you should have after you look at the word completion task? Well, if there is a word, you should on average be relatively confident there is. If there's not, you shouldn't be that confident that there's not. On the whole, those numbers average to greater than one half. Run the numbers if you like. Any model of the structure will have the same feature. The key feature is that these numbers are different and this number is gotten by conditioning on not fine. You can ask me about it if you like. Um, so uh, the key result there is just supposed to be that if we have this asymmetry and ambiguity, we can engender an expected shift in belief. Sometimes your belief, your confidence should go up that there's a word. Sometimes it should go down, but they don't average out. On average, it should go up. So across trials, across people, it should go up. That's the claim about why this example gives ambiguous evidence and why it would be polarizing. Why would it nevertheless be valuable? Why is it the sort of evidence you want to get? Why isn't this just an illustration of irrationality? And here lies a rabbit hole, which we could go far down and I have gone far down. So do ask me about it. But the short story in this sort of model is this. Notice that the posterior probability is getting more accurate in every world. So there are three possibilities. This one, this one, this one. Start with this one. Suppose this is the actual world. And there's a word and you found it. You start out one fourth confident of that, you end up certain of it. So you get more confident in the actual world. Consider this possibility. There's a word and you don't find it. You start out one fourth confident of that, you end up one half. And so on, right? Uh, the point is you're always getting more accurate come what may, or you should get more accurate if you use the evidence properly. But these accuracy increases, increases are asymmetric. Your accuracy increases more on average if there is a word than if there's not. And that asymmetry is what's inducing the predicted shift on average in credence. That's what's generating the polarization. Do ask me about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move along for the purposes of time, but ask me about that if you're, if you're curious. It's a lot of interesting stuff to say. So that was a theory, right? That was why I thought this should work in principle. But would it, right? Um, so in order to polarize my audience, what I did was I, I used this task on them. And the idea was first, uh, divide the audience into two groups, call them the headsers and the tailsers. Headsers and tailsers will see different word completion tasks and everyone knows this stuff. So I flip a coin and if it lands heads, then I show heads as a completable string and tails as an uncompletable string. Whereas if it lands tails, then I show heads as an uncompletable string and tails as a completable string. So the key asymmetry is that heads as get evidence that's easier to recognize in the case where the coin lands heads because they get a completable string. And tails as get evidence that e that's easier to recognize in the case where it lands tails because then they get a completable string. So the idea is that what this is supposed to do is uh, make it easier for headsers to recognize heads cases and easier for tailsers to recognize tails cases. So what I would do is I would uh, set, do the setup, give them the two different word completion tasks, one group would close their eyes and so on. Uh, and then they would write down their posterior confidence. We would tally those numbers, two people would tally them for me. And then I'd go on and give the talk while that was happening, while they were tallying. And I would explain the theory behind how this is supposed to work, the things I just explained to you. I would explain for example, that what it's supposed to do is induce two mirror image models of the same structure for headsers and for tailsers, right? The, the key idea was that for tailsers, if the coin, again, don't worry about the details if it's too much, but the idea is that for tailsers, the coin lands tails, you can get unambiguous evidence. If it lands heads, you only get ambiguous evidence. For headsers, vice versa. So the prediction then was that headsers would be better at recognizing heads cases Tails are better at recognizing tails cases, and so they should on average split apart. And the way we would find out was at the end of the talk, I would then say, all right, people have tallied the numbers. What are the numbers? We expect the heads are number to be higher than tails are number. And it was a good 
cliffhanger, very nerve, nerve wracking way to give a talk. I apologize that it's hard to do over this webinar format, but uh, short story is it does work. So in, in six of seven presentations, at least it worked, including the job talk at Pitt, which um, anyways, let's, let's be glad that it worked there. <laughs> the, the seventh one was less fun, uh, but I think that was good. So, uh, so okay, at this stage in the project, I'm thinking, great, there's something here. Um, I'm gonna keep working on this, but there's still obviously a lot to do. In particular, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to bring this to any sort of realistic empirical setting. Uh, and so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna to try to, today, I'm gonna to try to make the argument that this does transport to real world polarization. The very first thing I needed to do, actually it wasn't the first thing I did, but it was like what I should have done immediately, is um, run a proper experiment for this. Because basically there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that we just want a controlled environment rather than doing this in front of audiences, which is you know, very messy. And the second reason is that there's a confound in the uh, example I gave you. I said, and what the models predict are that ambiguous evidence gives rise to predictable rational polarization. But ambiguous evidence is not the same thing as weak evidence. Weak evidence is evidence that just shouldn't move your opinion very much. Ambiguous evidence is evidence such that you should be unsure how weak it is. And so if your evidence is massively ambiguous, it will be weak, right? If you really don't know what to make of your evidence, you shouldn't make a lot of it. You shouldn't move your opinion quite a lot. But if it's weak, it needn't be ambiguous. It can be perfectly unambiguous and still move your opinion only a little. So here is a concrete example to illustrate that fact. Um, like every favorite Bayesian example, there are urns of unknown composition. There's a coin and urns of unknown composition. So in urn A, there's one black marble and one red marble. Here's urn A. In urn B, there's two red marbles. Here's urn B. They're gonna be chosen randomly. I'm gonna flip a coin, choose an urn, and hold it close to my chest. You won't know which urn I'm holding. Right? And I'm gonna draw a single marble out of that urn and show it to you. Right? Now you might see a black marble, you might see a red marble. Right? A black marble is strong evidence because it tells you definitely he's holding urn A. There's no way that could have come from urn B. A red marble is weak evidence because it shows, well, it's more likely that he's holding urn B, but it could have come from urn A. There's some, some chance, not a great chance, that it could have come from urn A. So you might get strong, you might get weak evidence. But you always get unambiguous evidence in the technical sense because you always should know how confident to be afterwards, right? If you see a black marble, you should be sure that I'm holding urn A, and you should be sure that you should be sure. You should have no doubt about how sure you should be that I'm holding urn A. Conversely, if you see a red marble, you shouldn't be sure which urn I'm holding, but you should know how confident you should be. Because you should, you should think to yourself, well, look, in two of the three possibilities where I see a red marble, that's one where he's holding urn B. So I should be two thirds confident he's holding urn B. So not only should you be two thirds confident of that, you should know that fact. You should know that you should be two thirds confident. And therefore you don't have ambiguous evidence in the technical sense. You have inconclusive evidence, you have weak evidence, but not ambiguous evidence. So, Weak evidence is not the same as ambiguous evidence. Now here's the worry. Here's the concern we need to control for with an experiment. Call it Gallo's challenge because Dimitri Gallo gave it to me after giving a job talk at Pitt. And it's a good, it's a good objection, it's a good worry. Uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. Uh, went off to Australia. Well, no, I think he's stuck in the US still actually. But it's Australia. Anyways, that's a tangent. All right, back to it. Um, so the challenge is this. Um, what if it's not ambiguity? which is driving the effect, but just weakness. What if people are underreacting to weak evidence? So consider the word completion task, right? Sometimes you get strong, unambiguous evidence. You find a word. Sometimes you get weak, ambiguous evidence. You don't find a word and you don't know what to make of that. How do we know what's driving the effect? Is it the fact that it's weak or the fact that it's ambiguous? I say ambiguity is driving the effect, but it could be just weakness. And there's some evidence that people underreact to weak evidence called conservatism, do ask me about that soon, if you like. And so uh, we need to control for that with a proper experiment. And so here's what I did. The prediction is gonna be that uh, ambiguity is gonna exacerbate polarization. And so here's the setup. Um, prolific online study. Um, divide everyone into two groups, the headsers and the tailsers. Um, 
Headsers are always going to get strong evidence when a coin lands heads and weak evidence when it lands tails. Tailsers, vice versa, will get strong evidence when the coin lands tails and weak evidence when it lands heads. But what sort of evidence they're going to get will vary between two conditions, which condition they're in. So the ambiguous condition says this, the evidence is going to come in the form of a word completion task. For them, it was just like the thing I did in front of audiences for my job talk. Right? It was just, if your head's there, you see a completable string of heads and uncompletable of tails and tails or vice versa. Right? Um, so that was just a replication of that experiment. The unambiguous condition was just like this urn drawing task, right? Where the evidence comes in the form of a draw from an urn of unknown composition. And if which, how the urn was selected determined, is determined by what group you're in and which way a coin lands. So if you're a headser, if a coin lands heads, you get urn A, and if it lands tails, you get urn B. So if it lands heads, you might get strong evidence, conclusive evidence that it's urn A. If it lands tails, you'll definitely get weak evidence. Conversely, if you're a tails or vice versa, if it lands tails, you get urn A, and heads, you get urn B. So what this does is it sets up sort of, both conditions have the same strong weak asymmetry, but only the first condition has a, ambiguous, unambiguous asymmetry. Two, well, several predictions, but here are the two main ones. Do ask me if you want to hear about the others. Prediction one was that the mean posterior credence in heads polarizes in the ambiguous condition. So we expect the average credence in heads after looking at word completion tasks to be higher for the heads than the tails. Prediction two is that the polarization is more extreme in the ambiguous and the unambiguous condition, because we expect ambiguity to exacerbate polarization. And the short story is that both of those were conform, confirmed. So here's, um, let me zoom in on this. Here are the progression of me and confidence in heads as I saw more tasks, each person did four tasks. Um, on the left is the ambiguous condition, on the right is the unambiguous condition. Blue lines are headsers, orange lines are tailsers. As you can see in the ambiguous condition, headsers start out 50-50. And slowly, as I see more tasks, average around 58% confident that the coin lands heads across trial. Tails are start at 50-50, average around 36%. These bars are 95% confidence intervals. That effect is significant and large. It's got a co and D effect of 1.6. Uh, so that's prediction one. Um, the ambiguous condition polarizes. Prediction two was that the unambiguous, it would polarize more than the, the unambiguous condition. So here's the unambiguous condition. As you can see, there is some polarization. Uh, heads end up around 54 and tails is around 48. Um, again, that's a significant difference. It's smaller. And crucially, uh, the difference of differences is significant. So uh, that's seen by an inter interaction effect in NOVA. And it's also seen by a um, bootstrapped confidence interval for the difference of differences, which is uh, positive. And so this difference is bigger than this difference. Ambiguity exacerbates polarization, uh, prediction confirmed. Uh, do ask me if you are curious about what I mean when I say it drives polarization, there's, there's some subtleties here. But, um, the upshot is supposed to be, okay, uh, the experiment wasn't just a fluke. Um, ambiguity could play a role in driving real people to polarize. But at this point, we're still in sort of abstract experiment land, right? We, we are nowhere near what we need to be because real people uh, do not get polarized on conservative versus liberal issues by looking at work completion tasks or draws from urns, right? Um, and so the question is, does this, any of this transport to uh, the real mechanisms that lead people to polarize? And what I wanna argue in the rest of the talk is that, yes, it does transport. Um, I'm gonna do that by focusing on two um, phenomena that uh, drive polarization and showing how ambiguity plays, I think, a role in both. So section four now on your handout. Um, here's what I did at this stage in the project, right? I sort of went looking into the details of the psychological literature and my notes on it to see if I could find ways in which ambiguity could be, in my sense, could be used to illustrate and explain um, polarization effects that we were seeing in real people. I went looking for evidence and trying to interpret evidence in a way that favored this hypothesis of rational polarization via ambiguous evidence, right? That should sound like something. Um, 
which it sounds like a phenomenon that's widely confirmed called confirmation bias, which is a tendency to seek and interpret evidence in a way that favors your prior belief. So as I was working on this project, I was exhibiting a clear instance of confirmation bias. And so what I'm gonna argue now is that that tendency, both in my own case and for our four experimental subjects, is rational epistemically so. I'm gonna focus on the interpret side of seek and interpret, uh, sometimes called bias assimilation, but do ask me about the difference and um, I think to say about that. So here's how a bias assimilation study or a version of confirmation bias study goes. You start out with some claim, D, like capital punishment has a deterrent effect. And you ask people what their opinion is about that claim and people have strong opinions on that. So there's some, some group of participants that like believe D, there's some that believe it's negation, there's some in the middle, but uh, that's fine. Most people have a strong opinion. Then what you do is you present both groups with two bits of evidence, one telling in favor of D and one telling against it. So for example, maybe you tell, give them two journal articles that are roughly symmetric and one says like, we looked at these states which had these policies and these murder rates, we ran these regressions and blah, it supports D. And this other study which does the opposite. And we, said, we ran, looked at these states and we ran these numbers and blah, 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 and it supports not D. Um, so you give both groups both evidence. And you might have hoped that sort of if you give people shared evidence, shared mixed evidence, they're going to sort of depolarize to some degree. They'll become less confident in their opinions. But that's definitely not what happens. Rather, what happens is that those who believed D prior, right, what do they think? They think, well, look, I saw these two bits of evidence, one supporting D and one telling against it. Well, once the one supporting D, that seemed like a good study. The one telling against it had all these like methodological problems with it. I was like, there were, there were details that I didn't quite think were legit and they maybe had some problems with their uh, study design and etc. So on the whole, this evidence supports D because I got one good study in favor of D and one mediocre study against it. Conversely, those who believed not D at the beginning do the exact opposite. Right? They say, well, look, I saw one bit of evidence in favor of D, one against D. Well, the one against D, that seemed fine. The one in favor of D, that had all these problems with it. Uh, and so on the whole, this tells against And the result is that, of course, then they, they polarize because they take their evidence to point in a different direction. They interpret the evidence differently depending on what their prior beliefs were. Now, the mechanism for how this happened is important. Mechanism is sometimes called selective scrutiny. And so it's not the fact that they just ignore the opposing study or just sort of don't, uh, they just sort of dismiss it or anything like that. Rather, they do in some sense the opposite. Uh, if you believe D, suppose, and you get these two studies, what you'll probably do is think, okay, that one that supported D, that's not that surprising, looks fine. The one that told against D, that's surprising. Let me look at the details of that study. Let me see what the reasoning was, what the methodology was. And you scrutinize it and find flaws with the methodology. You find ways in which the study could you know, basically be misrepresenting what its data actually supports. And conversely, of course, the people who believe not to do the exact opposite, they scrutinize a study that favored D and they often find flaws with it. And according to researchers, they often find legitimate flaws with the studies they scrutinize. And that's what leads them to polarize. And so the claim I want to argue for here is that this whole process is rational. Both that is epistemically rational, both the, the process of selectively scrutinizing evidence that's incongruent, that doesn't fit your prior beliefs, and the resulting polarization from that selective scrutiny. This is inspired by and related to some great work by Tom Kelly. There are some important differences. Do ask me about those if you like. So here's how I'm gonna make this argument. And uh, I think we have the tools to make it relatively straightforward at this point. What are you doing when you're scrutinizing a study? Suppose you believe D and you're scrutinizing a study that tells against D, disconfirming study. What you're doing is what's sometimes called a form of cognitive search. You're searching an accessible cognitive space to see if it contains an item of a particular profile, an alternative explanation that fits a study and explains away the data. Right. That should sound like something. Right. It's a lot like searching your lexicon for a word that fits a string. Right. It's a lot like a word completion task. Right. It's got the structure of an existential task versus a universal task, finding an explanation versus showing that there is none. And so if that's right, it should engender the same sort of asymmetry and ambiguity that we got in the word completion task. You're scrutinizing the study. If there is an alternative explanation of it, then you can find one. You can get unambiguous evidence that there is such an explanation. Right? And therefore you can get clear evidence against you know, that debunks the study. 
If there's no alternative explanation in that study, if it's, a, if it's a rock solid study, then you can only get ambiguous evidence that there's not. You won't find one. You won't find a flaw with the study. But you should be unsure what to make of that. You should be unsure whether you just missed one, you just, whether you just messed up. You should have higher order uncertainty. You should be unsure whether you should be more confident that there is an explanation, whether you should find one and therefore you have ambiguous evidence. So again, we have the same asymmetry. If there is an explanation, you can get unambiguous evidence. If there's not, you can only get ambiguous evidence. And so on average, on the whole, you tend to get more evidence in favor of there being an explanation than against it. And that's why cognitive search is, I say, predictably polarizing on the claim that um, there is an alternative explanation. So here is a model of this. Again, don't worry about the details if you don't like details of like this. Um, it's just the word completion task model generalized with general parameters. So call it a cognitive search model. Either there's an explanation or there's not, and either you find one or you don't. Three possibilities is you can't find an explanation that's not there. And again, uh, the key asymmetry is that if you find one, you can get unambiguous evidence that there is one. If you don't find one, you get ambiguous evidence about whether there is one. The key thing is in this little model, if there's no explanation, you just condition on the fact that you didn't find one. But if there is, maybe you should have a different level of confidence. The, these numbers have to be different in order to engender ambiguity. And they, this one has to be higher for it to be valuable. Um, ask me about that. If you like the short stories, any model of the structure will be predictably polarizing on the claim that there's an explanation. Right? Same reason as the word completion task. Now, what direction is polarizing about the target claim, D, about whether capital punishment has a deterrent effect? That depends on which study you're scrutinizing, right? If E would explain away a disconfirming study, then it, that would you know, support D. And so it's a scrutinizing a disconfirming study leads to a predictable polarization in favor of D. Conversely, if E would explain away a confirming study, then that leads to predictable polarization against D. If you scrutinize confirming studies, you predict to, to get uh, evidence against D. Okay. So that's how I think if you scrutinize selectively in this way, you can be predictably polarized. But we haven't answered a very important question here, which is, well, what drives the choice of which study to scrutinize, right? That's sort of what the key thing that drives bias assimilation. For a long time here, I was stuck right? because I had this intuition, both from this model and sort of general considerations in these sort of high order probability contexts that, well, look, suppose your motive is to get accurate beliefs then your motive should be to avoid be to avoid ambiguity because ambiguity can lead to inaccuracy. It makes you uncertain. And so you should try to avoid ambiguity. Where, how are you going to avoid ambiguity? Well, if you find an explanation, you get unambiguous evidence. So, so scrutinize a study where you expect to find an explanation. You're more likely to find an explanation. And now I think it's pretty plausible to say you're more likely to find an explanation um, in the in find an explanation if there is one in the incongruent study, the one that does not fit your prior belief. So if you believe D, you should expect that you're more likely to, you're gonna be better at finding explanations of, study, of arguments that tell against D or bits of evidence that tell against D. The basic idea here is look, being convinced of something, being convinced of D, part of what that involves is learning how to rebut arguments against it. Part of what is involved in my process of being polarized on polarization is that now after many years, I can rebut all sorts of arguments against this idea. And so the idea would be, um, well, look, you should scrutinize, um, be more inclined to scrutinize the study that tells against your prior beliefs, because that's where you expect to find one. That was the hunch, but it's just a hunch. And in order to show that, I mean, it's very hard to prove anything analytically with models that are just this general and over time. And so I was stuck here until I took time off the project and then was working on another project where I finally learned to program and code. Hashtag Kevin Zolman and the importance of computational models on uh, for philosophy. Anyways, I came back to this project, I was like, ah, just simulate it. <laughs> so uh, we can ge randomly generate cognitive search models. We can, first of all, see if that hunch was right. Is there a correlation between the chance of finding an explanation if there is one and accuracy? And the answer is yes, here's um, 10,000 randomly generated cognitive search models. X axis is chance of finding an explanation if there is one. Y axis is expected accuracy on the Breyer score, standard way of measuring accuracy. As you can see, it's noisy, but there's a robust positive correlation between uh, the two. And so once we have that correlation, we can then just say, okay, let's just 
have two groups of agents. One group, the red group, is going to be better at explaining away disconfirming studies. The other, the blue group, is going to be better at explaining away confirming studies. At each stage in the simulation, they could present, each person gets presented with two different studies, one favoring, one telling against this claim D. They choose which one to scrutinize based on which one they expect is going to make them more accurate, which, as we see from this correlation, is going to be correlated with where they expect to find one, find an explanation. And the result is polarization. Here's a single run, but it's representative. Uh, they all pretty much look like this. Um, so the, the thin red lines are the individual pro agents, the ones better at recognizing problems with disconfirming studies. The, the thin blue lines are con agents. The thick ones are the averages of each group. This should be D, not Q. Um, and so what happens is sort of the red agents tend to scrutinize the disconfirming ones more and they tend to therefore get more confident of D and vice versa. By the way, they all know about the parameters of the model. They all know that everyone's gonna do this. So this is, the fact that they polarize is no surprise to anyone in the model. So the upshot I wanna say is that look, confirmation bias can be driven by an attempt, a rational attempt to get accurate beliefs in the face of ambiguous evidence. In my search for an explanation of confirmation bias, I found one. I got an unambiguous evidence in favor of the ambiguity idea. So that was the first uh, mechanism I wanna talk about. I wanna spend a little bit of time at the end here talking about a second mechanism uh, that drives real world polarization that drove my polarization. So I'd been debating the rationality of polarization um, amongst basically philosophers and cognitive scientists, sort of uh, a group that is more inclined to see rationality um, than many other people, for instance, psychologists would be, or maybe the, the, the public at large. And so I was talking with basically like-minded people about this idea, and I was slowly becoming more confident of it. That's no surprise, because one of the most well-confirmed findings in social psychology is something called the group polarization effect, or sometimes enclave liberation. And this is the effect that in general, not always, but in general, discussions amongst like-minded people tend to lead them to become more extreme in their opinions than they were before discussion. Right? And so this is a well-confirmed empirical finding. You find it from in, in everything from like politics to the comfort of dental chairs, for example. So it's, it's all over the place. And so question, does ambiguity have a role to play in explaining the group polarization effect? I think it does. So the mechanism, the psychological process by which people get polarized uh, in group polarization is, is widely agreed upon. There are a variety of mechanisms, but what everyone agrees is the strongest mechanism and the one that explains most of the data is basically people listening to arguments. Uh, the idea is, look, if you're talking amongst like-minded people, you're more likely to see an argument in favor of the view you hold than an argument against it. And the implicit premise that most people don't say Arguments tend on average to persuade people. Um, and so that's why people get persuaded by talking amongst like-minded people. There are some subtleties here, actually a lot of subtleties here, so do ask me about them, but that's the basic psychological idea. But here's a question which most people don't ask. Why would arguments tend to persuade people? Right? In particular, why would someone be able to predict that they're gonna be persuaded by an argument, right? In fact, we have a theorem, in fact, one on the handout, that if their evidence is unambiguous and they're Bayesian, they can't predict that, right? After all, arguments can't guarantee a rise in your confidence. If a defense attorney stands up and says, I'm gonna argue for my client's innocence now, right? You should think, well, maybe my confidence is gonna go up. Maybe she's gonna give a great argument that I didn't expect. But maybe she's gonna give like an argument that's sort of not very convincing. And I think if, that, if that's the best she can do, then surely that's because her client isn't innocent. And so if the argument is worse than you expect, that should actually lead you to lower your confidence that in the thing they're arguing for. So arguments can't guarantee a rise in confidence. Right? So how, how could it be that arguments tend to persuade? And the answer I wanna suggest is ambiguity. That what arguments can do is make it easier to recognize favorable reasons for the claim they're arguing for and harder to, recognizing un, to recognize unfavorable ones. They can manipulate the ambiguity of the evidence they're presenting. One way to put it in sort of slogan form is that good arguments tend to be made because they are good. Bad arguments tend to be made because they sound good. 
and they sort of look like they might be good. And so it's hard to recognize the bad arguments. It's easier to recognize good arguments as good than it is to recognize bad arguments as bad, i.e. good arguments are less ambiguous than bad arguments. Here's like a simple example to pump your intuition on this. Like that. Suppose the defense attorney stands up and says, I'm gonna argue my client is innocent and the way I'm gonna do that is by establishing that he was good friends with the victim. Here's one argument you might give. Look, all the victim's friends came to the party and as we know, my defendant was at the party, so he was a friend. Here's another argument you might give. Look, all those who came to the party were the victim's friends and as you know, my defendant was at the party, so he was a friend. You spot the difference? The first argument is in effect affirming the consequent. Right? It's a fallacy. The second argument is basically modus ponens, just universally generalized. Uh, and a well-confirmed empirical finding is people are worse at recognizing tempting fallacies as fallacies than they are at recognizing analogous validities as validities. People are quicker to say this is valid than they are to say that this is invalid. And so that's an example of an argument, an ambiguity asymmetry, I wanna say quality of arguments. So if that's right, we can give a simple model of this. Um, again, don't worry about the details. The point is that the argument might be good, it might be bad. If it's good, your credence that it's good should shift more. And if it's bad, your credence should shift. So um, there's sort of an ambiguity asymmetry here. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna zoom through this. If we do that, and then we split people into two groups. One, the red group receives arguments favoring Q so that if they're good, um, their credence in Q should go up. If they're bad, it should go down. And the other vice versa, then they polarize. And here's a single run, again, it's representative. Uh, and the point is, again, the red, argument, the red agents are good at recognizing favoring evidence, not good at recognizing disfavoring evidence. So they go up on average and the blue agents come, vice versa. Again, the whole thing can become a knowledge about what's going on. So the upshot I wanna say is that the group polarization effect can be driven by a rational sensitivity to asymmetries, ambiguity asymmetries in arguments. So my process of being polarized by talking with people could be rational. To just sum up then from what probably was a bit of a whirlwind tour, um, section six. So the, the new story I've been arguing for, for explaining polarizations that look, a rational sensitivity to ambiguous evidence to asymmetries in ambiguous evidence plays a significant role in driving real world predictable polarization, in politics and economics and so on. What I've argued for is that that story has a firm theoretical foundation. It's basically predicted purely from abstract Bayesian models. It fits with old predictions about the connection between ambiguity and predictable polarization. It helps explain new things like the word completion task polarization finding experiment. And it plausibly helps play a role in some of the real world mechanisms that drive polarization, like confirmation bias, like group polarization effect. So that is a streamlined version of the story of how I became predictably, and I think rationally, polarized in the claim that polarization could be driven by rational processes. And I want to conclude with one final argument. Notice a structural feature of the story. I argued for rational, rational explanations of predictable polarization and explain how I became more confident that. A story for the opposite conclusion would end up incoherent. So I conclude, look, polarization is rational, and I came to believe that through rational polarizing mechanisms by working on this project. That's a coherent state to be in. P and I'm rational to believe it. If I was arguing for irrationalism, I would end up thinking, polarization is irrational, and I came to believe that through irrational polarizing mechanisms. That's not a coherent state. That's a, sometimes called epistemically acratic state. It's like believing P, but I shouldn't believe it. P, but my evidence doesn't support it. Or P, but I've come to believe that for irrational reasons. Most people think, and the value of evidence entails, that that's not coherent, that's not rational. And so what I wanna point out is that the exact same asymmetry applies to you as it applies to me. Take any of your predictably polarized beliefs be they ones about politics or philosophy or economics or religion or what have you. Ones that in hindsight, you can look back and think, yeah, that was driven by the predictable polarization processes that shift beliefs. For any of those beliefs, you'd better buy in to a rational story explaining that. Because if you don't, you'll end up acratic in exactly this way. You'll think, yeah, P is true, my beliefs about economics say, but I came to believe that for a rational reasoning. 
that's not a coherent state. So if you want to maintain your coherence and also maintain your predictably polarized beliefs, you better want some version of a, a rational polarization story like the story I told to be right. So that's my final plea and argument that you should get on, get on, on board. I will wrap up right there. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you very much um, for this awesome talk. Maybe you could get out of the, um, yes. um, the screen share option. So let me remind you about how uh, the Q&A works. If you have a question for Kevin, please go to the bottom of your screen, click on the button uh, Q&A, write your name, and I will promote you to the status of panelists that you can engage with uh, Kevin directly and I don't need to mediate. Shaheen had a question and we'll, we'll start first and then I'll promote the other um, uh, uh, question. Shaheen, go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, I was wondering if you've looked into asymmetric polarization and how you think your model could or could not accommodate it. So um, if you look at the data for political polarization, um, there is often this idea that it wasn't symmetric. It's not like Democrats and Republicans both moved away from each other. And I've actually seen studies that make opposite claims. So some of them say, it looks like Republicans, like Pew Research, when you look at their polarization, it looks like Republicans stayed where they were pretty much in the 90s and Democrats moved a lot to the left. And then there are other studies that say otherwise, the Democrats stayed where they are and Republicans moved to the right. But regardless of which one is right, it seems like, it looks like that which result you get depends on which questions you ask. And so it seems like on some questions, uh, polarization occurred because Democrats moved to the left. And on some questions, polarization has occurred because Republicans moved to the right. Um, so why would it be asymmetric if it's due to ambiguity of evidence? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't they both move? Good. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so let me think about right approach is. Um, This is, I think, an opportunity to jump into, if you look at the handout, you know there's like two pages of bonus <laughs> material. So uh, maybe I'll share my screen again and, and uh, look at that point. Um, so zooming down, um, what does this model predict about when polarization will be extreme or not? Here's one way to get some like very high level traction on that. There's a characterization of what valuable ambiguous evidence models look like. Um, you can randomly generate those models, uh, again, using the coding skills you learned because you listened to Kevin Zolman. Uh, and then you can you know, measure the degree of ambiguity asymmetry on some like natural metrics, uh, basically sort of how much less ambiguous is the evidence if it favors Q than if it tells against Q um, in these models and plot that against expected shifts in opinion. So the degree of expected polarization. And what you get is this sort of plot where as uh, evidence gets more asymmetrically ambiguous in favor of Q, you get more expected shifts in favor of Q. When it gets more asymmetrically ambiguous against it, you get more expected shifts against it. So that's sort of an abstract thing that sort of ramping up degree of ambiguity asymmetry should lead to ramped up degrees of polarization. Now, how exactly to ground that into the concrete questions uh, is hard, but the idea would be something like in some context, for some questions, um, you know, one group is getting a lot of asymmetric evidence, uh, asymmetrically ambiguous evidence about it. So like if Fox News is going on and on about some particular, you know, uh, cancel culture, then, uh, you know, you should expect Republicans to move quite a bit on that. And you should, if you know, New York Times and Washington Post don't talk about it, then you should not expect Democrats to move. Conversely, if, um, Supposing, of course, that sort of when Fox News tries, they engender asymmetrically ambiguous evidence, which is sort of an interesting way, but I won't have it try to work out. So that would be the style of response I would try to give is try to look at correlates for like how asymmetrically ambiguous is the evidence and see whether that can um, predict um, what exactly the shift. Now that's sort of strategy. What to say in any particular case, I have less certainty about. I haven't looked too much into the um, the particular questions that lead to these things to send me, please do. I mean, I know some of them, but 
Uh, I, a quick follow-ups uh, along those lines. So does it follow from your model that if one side generates more studies in favor of their view, they risk polarizing people against their view? Like if Democrats keep churning out studies for that gun control is good and Republicans keep looking at those and they find flaws in some of them, uh, so they think, oh, this is problematic, but then they're the ones that they don't find flaws in, they're just like, okay, whatever. Um, so it has that that sort of asymmetry that you were talking about. But if there there aren't as many studies against gun control, then you don't get the similar effect on the other side. So does that mean we should not produce studies for our views? That would be a fascinating prediction. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think it's super subtle. So on the one hand, um, the uh, you know scrutiny results I was looking at were ones where um, people have both studies and they decide which one to scrutinize and that this leads to uh, an asymmetry. But it didn't actually model the effect of sort of the initial effect of seeing the studies to begin with. And I would take it that that would be basically thought of properly. Um, we shouldn't like merge the argument and the scrutiny model. So like you could present it with a study favoring claim. And that's sort of like gives you, gives you an argument model where it makes, if it's a good argument, it gets relatively clear. And if it's a bad argument, it's relatively unclear. And then you can scrutinize it if you want. And if it's a bad argument, maybe you'll find a problem with it and you'll make it unambiguous. But if it's a good argument, maybe you won't. So actually which direction the sort of uh, ambiguity tends to be depends on whether you decide to scrutinize this argument. So not to <laughs> jump to my, I'm gonna to jump to my <laughs> uh, bonus materials again. Um, so here's a little model of what would happen if we combine them. So if you don't scrutinize the study, you get just a standard argument model like I was doing. If you do scrutinize it, you get a cognitive search model on the argument model so that the bad possibility splits into one where you might find a problem and get unambiguous evidence, the good one doesn't. Now here's the kicker. What scrutinizing does, or, what the model straightforwardly predicts is that people don't, if people don't scrutinize, they'll tend to be convinced. If they do, it really depends on the parameters for whether they end up being convinced. And so there's not a super clear prediction here. So here's an example where the red agents never scrutinize, the blue agents always do. If you just randomly generate it from the parameters, you get this curve where the blue agents don't really move. There's a lot of noise here, but that's, that's the meaning. Um, but if you shift the parameters somewhat, then the blue agents might actually go up, they might actually go down. And so that's one reason that I, one thing I'm dissatisfied about this current thing is that just from the structure of the model, you don't yet predict what direction seeing, um, sorry, I'll put it. We do predict this. Uh, if everyone's scrutinizing, if you scrutinize a study systematically, you're gonna be less convinced by it than if you don't. Um, and so if we have some empirical data on whether people scrutinize these studies we're generating, then that can tell us you know, whether it's gonna shift their opinion against it or not. But, um, don't, I mean, there's gotta be some way to try to get more traction on this, but just from the models themselves, we don't know whether scrutinizing an argument should necessarily make someone on average more convinced or less. It depends on the parameter relation between the argument model and the scrutiny model. And so no clear verdict then on exactly what we should do. But that's, I, mean, never, I had not thought about that. So I, I, will, I, I will think more about um, this. Thanks Shaheen. Clara, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, Kevin. Thank you for a good talk. It's very interesting. Um, so actually, my question was very close to Shane's question. Uh, yeah, I was also basically curious about cases where we might think what's going on is um, that one group is remaining relatively stable in their opinions, whereas we have a second group where they're moving away um, from the other group. Um, but I was fairly satisfied with the response you already gave. So we can, we can move on to the next question. Well, I mean, one thing that I think maybe I, I can add is that um, I think it will, I mean, this is not a surprising prediction. I don't think, it, good job, Kevin, but here's a, here's a prediction. Mm -hmm. It's uh, if you have a space where people are presented with all sorts of different opinions and different arguments for and against various claims, you should expect less polarization in that space than if you're in a space where people get only arguments in one direction. So as people get more siloed, you might think you predict more direction then sort of more, more shifts on the things they're talking about. And so you might think, one scary thing that the pandemic, pandemic arguably makes people more siloed. <laughs> um, and so you might think that that could um, 
certainly intuitively, when you think of sort of the rise of conservative media, many people tell stories on which what it did was make sort of a, a situation where most people saw arguments consistently in a particular direction and not opposing views. Of course, you can also tell the story about the liberal bias in media. So anyway, that sort of interacts with yeah, it's a great question. So if you have something about Thank you. Thanks, Cloud. Nick, floor is yours. Hi. Thanks, Kevin. That was kind of very interesting. Um, and yeah, I, you've got me pretty convinced. I guess the question that there is a kind of an effect, you know, an effect due to kind of rational processes. So my question is more along the lines of how much of the sort of observed fact is, you know, the observed effect is going to be due to rational processes, you know, and how much is going to require the irrational expert sort of explanation. So it's a long time since I've looked at the Lord Ross and Leffer that you that you kind of that you referred to, um, but looking at the you know the graph that you have on I think page five, where then you get the nice splitting. It seems like by the time the, the splits got to sort of 0 0.6, 0 0.4, it's pretty, it's a pretty flat line at that point. And I'm not quite sure where in their study, I hope this makes sense, where in their study the initial positions are. But they're not polarized or, you know, close to 0 0.5, they'd be further apart. So I'm wondering if in that experiment you'd be predicting basically very little polarization and not as much, say, as they actually, you sort of see in that kind of experiment. Does that, does that question, does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. And one that, I mean, you know, once you, again, the credit for Kevin, so once you drink the Kevin Zolman, et cetera, at all Kool-Aid and start working on the simulations, there's so many, so you know, I've gone down so many rabbit holes with variations of these simulations. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to keep track of exactly what, the, what all the variants are. So a few thoughts though. Um, uh, in these simulations to represent, um, basically hardening of opinions. That's sort of as people get more evidence, their opinions should shift left, left with new evidence. That's sort of hard coded in. It's not, it's not gonna fall straightforwardly from the structure of the model of, of sort of, it's not gonna fall straightforwardly from probabilism, for example. And so uh, how much the, the, the peak of the disagreement is gonna be in these models, it just depends on that parameter. I don't have sort of a, a priori way to set it. Although there may be limits to it. And that's one variation I would think about. Another thing I should say is that um, this I'm not sure I'd have to go back and check, but at least for the, the, the directional split is fairly robust. So if they don't start at 50, 50, but they start out at like 60, 40, then they will split and end up more than a 60, 40 split, for example. Um, I don't know whether that holds when they're like 95, 0.5. It may, in some cases, there may be sort of limits to how much they can do. Um, in some variants of the argument models, there are, I mean, like if all the arguments for P are bad, objectively, if they in fact all are bad, uh, then even if you have this asymmetry, it's not gonna polarize people because everyone's gonna eventually recognize it. And so there are some limits to what it can do. I should say that sort of theoretically, there's no limit to um, how far apart people's opinions could predictably get. So in the heads or tails are game, if you just follow that model and iterate it, um, then uh, headsers will on average be able to predict with arbitrary confidence that if they do this for many, arbitrarily many tasks, they will estimate that the proportion of heads they've seen is around like 58. Tailsers will recognize, estimate that it's around 42. They will be, both be very confident in those estimates in the sense that if you ask them, how confident are you that it's more than 50% heads? then heads will be arbitrarily confident of that, tails will be arbitrarily confident of negation. They both will know that the other person's arbitrarily confident of it. For example, updating the fact that they are doesn't shift their opinion. So like, there's no limit in principle to how far the polarization could go. Now, in practice, how much the very simulations generate is a harder question, but it's a good question. Okay. So it sounds like if, I, if you wanna pose the question of whether there's both rational and irrational effects in what you sort of see, it's hard to test that because there are, if I'm what I get from what you're saying, there are parameters in the model that will, that are kind of un, un, aren't fixed, but sort of a priori. So you, yeah. you could fit the you could fit the observed data, but okay. And so I, do you want to say there's no 
there's no component of irrational thought in these processes. So that's that's not. It, it sounded from the paper that you want to say, especially for your own case, anyway, that it's all the all the rational stuff and no irrational. Um, no, yeah, I don't want to say that. But <laughs> um, but what the thing is, I want. It's hard to say what the thing is that I want to say that's in that's precise in, in between. I mean, what's what I what I think is sort of should be completely uncontroversial is that there is irrationality in the sense that people's actual opinions are not perfect indicators of how confident they should be. So like in that simple model I gave, like um, surely part of what will be associated with ambiguous evidence is being unsure how confident to be. People are probably gonna have a lot more variance in their opinions than that sort of, you might think of their actual opinions as sort of a noisy, maybe bell-shaped indicator of what their rational opinions are. So there's definitely irrationality all over the place. The question I think was somewhat more tractable, although still not tractable, is uh, whether that the noise has to be biased itself or whether sort of the mean of the people's actual confidence can actually be the rational confidence. And part of what the models are doing is saying, even if it is, then you can get these sort of effects. Um, so I definitely think people mess up all the time. That's part of why ambiguity is such a thing that we don't know whether we've messed up. Um, but the question of whether they systematically mess up is one that I'm much, is much harder to address, I think, than people have thought. Thank you, that's great. Really appreciate it. Bright, floor is yours. Yeah, hi, Kevin. Thanks for a uh, really, really interesting talk. Um, and laying cards on the table here, former Tom Kelly student, so kind of been indoctrinated into how to think about these kinds of cases. Um, but I wanted to ask, actually, it's the question that I had when I would talk to Tom about this stuff, too. I wanted to ask, like, in the biased assimilation case, the Lord et al., like the older studies, um, what's your reason for thinking that that involves something to do with, like, epistemic rationality at all, such that we can call it epistemically rational? I mean, I'm sure you're w well aware of this, but just to put another view on the table, um, if you had, like, a kind of traditional view on which epistemic rationality is just how you fit your beliefs to the evidence, it's not obvious that how you gather evidence, how you go about scrutinizing the evidence that you find is necessarily within that realm. It's just about like what you end up taking up as evidence, right? So you might call that, I mean, people call it like the rationality of inquiry and then have debates about whether or not that's epistemic rationality or not. Um, do you, just sort of like a background theoretical question about why you would think that that's rational at all. Also, I mean, to be completely honest, once you start thinking about it as like, you need to have good inquiry practices. It strikes me as a lot less plausible that this involves rational processes because I'm presented with two studies and I only scrutinize one. And then I go, okay, awesome. I've done my job as an inquirer. That's, that seems rather irrational to me. Um, you could even ask like a similar question about like the, this type of story Tom told where it's like, when once you've rejected one hypothesis, you increase your your credence in the other hypothesis because it's the only one left. It's like, well, that's not very plausible because you have just as much reason to think that you uh, would have or could have rejected the other hypothesis with similar levels of scrutiny. So how does that asymmetry play out there? But anyway, that's more specific. I'm mostly just interested in like, why should we think of these things as epistemically rational, uh, especially given that when we don't, it strikes me that I start to lose the grip on it being a rational process at all, basically. Yeah, uh, that's that's a fantastic question, um, and I think my answer will partly be, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, but in response to the second worry, that sort of that's why I want to I want to bring some notion of um, epistemic evaluation at least for uh, process of inquiry on the table. So the the first thing um, I say is I'm very sympathetic to like I mean the general idea that like you know what. If you find yourself at a time with fixed evidence and available information, then like the rational thing to do is just to sort of fit your opinion to that as well as you can. And that will include often facts about how you came to that evidence and so on. So, but as uh, Tom makes clear. Um, but so if I lean into that, then uh, there's a much simpler way to use these models, which is just people scrutinize whatever they like. And then you just see what their uh, opinions do. And if you do that, um, so if you just make the red group always scrutinize the disconfirming study and the blue group always scrutinize the confirming study, then you'll just get much more extreme polarization. So it's just sort of, uh, that sells something related to uh, next question. And that I think, you know, if on a certain view, 
that is epistemically rational for not only that, since all the transitions are valuable in the sense that you always expect that you're getting more accurate as you do them, then it's not like, I mean, you might think you would get even more and more accurate if you did this other scrutiny thing, but it's not like you just sort of, you think you're making yourself worse off. You, you expectedly are, and I think it usually objectively are, making yourself better off in the individual instance. Um, and so I might say, yeah, that's, that's perfectly epistemically rational and that satisfies the value of evidence and you're using your evidence as well as you can. The reason, yeah, the reason I want to, I would like to say more, although I don't think it's strictly speaking necessary, is that you might think, okay, well, once you have models like this, where choices about, um, basically all our choices about how to scrutinize lead to expected shifts in our opinion, you might think other norms should kick in to guide, you sort of, want to sort of control for your expected polarization. You sort of don't look only at New York Times because you want to sort of get some other stuff in there. Don't look only at Fox because you, yeah. And I want to sort of think about those norms. And what I, what I want to say there is, well, okay, I don't know whether we want to call it epistemic per se or not, but there are various sort of epistemic like goals we might have. And what I think is especially interesting is if our goal is like get accurate beliefs, then, uh, at least some degree of bias assimilation and selective scrutiny, less so, but at least some degree uh, is something that we should be doing. So that's that's sort of what the second half of the simulations are supposed to be. So I was trying to sort of somewhat guard against the idea that this really is in some broader sense irrational. Well, it could be, yeah. The effect can be driven by sort of purely epistemic goals, even if in fact, maybe it, it's, it's not always. Thanks, right. Um, Shaheen, I another question, but I, I, I'll take the advantage of uh, um, <laughs> hosting the, the meeting to ask a really uh, simple question. So it's a, it's a follow-up to um, uh, the, the place where you started when you were looking at uh, word completion experiments. And one might think that something that bears on uh, the second order probability or the, or the confidence about the first order evidence is length time, right? How much time I have to search through memory. Yeah. And that's, that, that's a nice valuable because it, it allows you to distinguish first order evidence. The first order evidence remains constant, but the second order evidence changes, right? The more time I have to search for, for, the, for the stem, for the completion of the stem. If I, don't, if I don't get it, I've got more second order evidence that, um, uh, 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 that it's, not, it's not completable. So that seems to be a very nice way. And, and, and so, I mean, I, I suppose your view makes predictions about the effect of search time in um, a polarization because uh, the more search time I have, the less the, the, less the evidence is, the less ambiguous the evidence is, right? Uh, so you should find less polarization by your models. And, and of course, it's, of course, it's a nice way to distinguish first and second order evidence. So I was wondering whether there's any data that bear on this variable and, uh, and if, 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 well, if I'm right that it bears on that your model makes prediction about it, whether there's any data and, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I definitely thought about what the model says just for like, I mean, it would make predictions for like data we don't even need to collect. Like if I write up um, like really dumb word strings, like no one's gonna be polarized by this. Like everyone knows that's not completable. Um, and sort of the, the degree of polarization will depend then on sort of the subtlety of uh, the word completion stress. So that sort of falls straight forward just because by modulating the um, probability of finding, if, if you're sure you're gonna find one if there is one, if you're sure the task is easy enough such that you'll find one if there is one, then there's no ambiguity. And another way to control for that, as you said, is by giving you more time to think about it. If, you, if I give you this word string and I give you 10 minutes, and you say, I say, do nothing else, <laughs> but look at this string. I take it by the end, you'll be sure if it's not completable, you'll be sure it's not. So that, that's data that I haven't collected, but I don't think I need to collect in order to sort of, uh, make that sort of prediction. But as for like the, yeah, the question about what this would mean in say the bias assimilation studies, I hadn't thought about that per se. And I don't, yeah, I don't know off the cuff. Um, there, are some, there are very, all sorts of ways of controlling for it. And, particular thing I know best is that controlling, like instructing people which option to scrutinize. And that is the best way to prevent them from polarizing. Um, but I don't know of like a uh, control for like giving them more or less time. So I will, I will look into that. 
other, if people have suggestions, please do. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Shaheen, we have a, a, a few more minutes. Go for it. Thank you. Um, so my question was uh, kind of similar to Brett's. Um, I about this notion of rationality and calling these polarization events rational. So I can take it the idea is like, yeah, if you're stuck in an echo chamber and you apply rational rational epistemic methods perfectly, then you will get polarized. But is it rational that you're stuck in an echo chamber? Like you did something wrong somewhere along the way. Um, I would say you committed some epistemic mistake that you got stuck in an echo chamber, right? So how rational is it really? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So in response to Brett, I think focusing on like the case of like which study to scrutinize in a localized context, it makes it more plausible that sort of epistemic considerations are driving it. In the case of like, where do I go to college? Do I go to this um, rural conservative college or do I go to this urban liberal college? Like clearly that decision is not gonna be based on at least not primarily based on anything about how expectedly accurate my beliefs are going to be afterwards. I mean, based on all sorts of other things. Um, so that's the case where I definitely want to say, yeah, it's not primarily epistemic things that are driving it. Um, nevertheless, um, the reaction to the evidence you happen to get can still be um, epistemically above board or whatever. How, yeah, what to say about sort of, you know, I definitely don't think it's a pure concern for the truth, which is driving polarization. That would be far too extreme a claim. Right? Uh, and so then, yeah, the question of what to say about those cases where you have all these practical factors which are driving what ambiguous evidence you get, and then a concern for the truth is driving how you process it. Um, yeah, I'm like, that's not a very good answer. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Reet, floor is yours. Hi, thank you for this interesting talk. Uh, I had also had a question because, um, so the, the mechanism that drives polarization now, uh, I thought it was very interesting that it happens in the scrutinizing cases, which are actually the cases where you're confronted with something that's uh, different from your prior beliefs. Yeah. But in polarization, you also often have as a sort of mechanism that you get confronted with more and more things that are actually consistent with your beliefs. So you get in your sort of bubble and so I was wondering if in polarization you're sort of moving towards a bubble where you only have your the things that are consistent with your beliefs. Is your mechanism going to play less and less of a role in driving polarization? Or yeah, um, I think the scrutiny mechanism will. Yeah, and so insofar, like I think here is one way we would test that: um, pay people to sort of continue checking their news sites, which are sort of um, you know, strongly biased, say. But we say like, every time you look at a site, you gotta try to find flaws with what they're saying. Ask them, you know, why are they saying that? Uh, I credit, like my, my mom blames my dad making me a philosopher by like, when we were young, uh, he would like play a game, like the advertisements coming on, he would ask sort of, okay, how are they able to say that without, you know, be skeptical of the advertiser or whatever. And so I was doing a lot of cognitive searches against advertisers. <laughs> um, and so, I, yeah, the prediction would be if you induce people to scrutinize in a particular way, then that would be a way to counteract polarization. Which by the way, when I think about like how to spitball methods to depolarize people on Twitter, you could try to think, can you incentivize somehow counter party uh, searches? But um, what I would wanna say is that insofar as people aren't scrutinizing and they're, uh, we can sort of squint and somehow model them with the um, argument asymmetry models, where if they're sort of not, if they're just sort of engaging with the things they see and taking them at face value, broadly speaking, then I would think that model predicts that as they get more and more echo chambery, then they will get more and more polarized because they'll get more, they'll tend to get more arguments favoring Q than against Q, um, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, the short story is that since the two mechanisms in some sense point in opposite directions, it's not a clear prediction, <laughs> which is a great way to cover your ass. That's a great question. Yeah, Thanks. okay, thank you.
Uh, Peter, if you have a short question, you can ask him. You can ask it now because we're reaching the end of our, our meeting. Oh, all right. I'll try and be quick. So this is sort of in line with what Reid brought up. Uh, I wanted to give the example of global warming, where we've seen in the sort of general discourse a greater degree of polarization than happened previously. And it seems that one very sensible way of explaining that is not is at least in large part due to a kind of linear. Uh, relationship between the amount of arguments that people hear and the strength of their credence in their beliefs. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, what proportion of rational or irrational decision making would would you assign to the asymmetry of ambiguous evidence versus the linearity of um, unambiguous evidence? Good. Um... I'm not entirely, yeah, the global warming case is an interesting one. I mean, there are some studies of a form like, um, you know, super people who score high on like cognitive reflection tasks and who know a lot, like tend to be more polarized in global warming. So that's like something I like to point to as like people who are really committed to and good at scrutinizing evidence can scrutinize it selectively and polarize themselves. I know plenty of smart people who convince themselves of things, accepting yours truly <laughs> um, uh, by, by scrutinizing well. Um, but uh, no, I, I can say it goes really because I you know it's rational. Um, but <laughs> what I would think is that insofar as more arguments, I don't know exactly how to model this. And so this is I guess, a more of a promise right now, but intuitively as more arguments crowd a space, there's more room for ambiguity because now I have to deal with trading off arguments. You have arguments and counter arguments and counter counter arguments. And it's sort of harder, even harder to track what to make of those sort of circumstances. And so insofar as sort of, that just increases sort of the baseline level of ambiguity in the air. You might expect that um, I mean, it's not a result that sort of more ambiguity leads to more polarization. It's more asymmetric ambiguity leads to more polarization. So I, I don't, there's a bridge here that I don't know how to cross yet. But the basic idea is if there's more ambiguity in general, maybe there within certain subgroups can be more asymmetric ambiguity and that can lead to sort of the, the graphs I showed at the beginning of the Q&A. But yeah, there's a promissory note there that I can't really cash at this point. Good question. Good, and we will uh, leave it here for today. I apologize for the few people who are still in the queue, but at 1.30, it's time to go. Thanks, Kevin, for this really uh, amazing talk. Um, I really personally like the combination of experimental work and, and philosophical work and computational work. It's just incredible. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, we hope to see uh, most of you in... Uh, the coming meeting, the so next one being on Wednesday for the uh, Philosophy of Cosmology seminar and on uh, Friday for Kate Stanton uh, lunchtime talk. Have a good, uh, have a good weekend. Bye. Thanks everyone.